Medicaid enables millions of low-income people in the United States to obtain health care services. Unfortunately, in part because Medicaid often reimburses physicians at a lower rate than Medicare or private insurance, U.S. physicians tend to be less willing to accept new Medicaid patients. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Sarah Rosenbaum, a professor of health policy at the George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services. Professor Rosenbaum has written a perspective article on Medicaid payments and access to care. Professor Rosenbaum, you mentioned in your article that the disparity between Medicaid and Medicare payments varies widely by state. Why is the range of Medicaid physician fees so large? The range is very large, as you point out. We know this from a relatively recent survey conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation. There are probably a lot of reasons why the payment ranges are so great in different states. Some states, for example, might put greater emphasis on eligibility expansion or benefit coverage and less access, ironically, on assuring that payment rates are high enough to assure access to care, at least in physicians' offices. For example, New York and New Jersey historically have been relatively low in what they pay physicians. They are also states that tend to rely very heavily on publicly financed clinics, community health centers, or in New York's case, their public hospital system. And in these states, it's become sort of a chicken-egg problem, which is to say that from the earliest days, the states did not emphasize private physician participation in the program, perhaps because private physicians did not participate in welfare-based healthcare programs, and then they didn't raise their rates, and then everybody got locked into historically low rates. Other states have been much more interested in greater physician participation. Their rates are higher so that there are actually states like, for example, North Dakota, whose physician payment rate is extremely high. It's higher than Medicare pays, which is quite unusual. Is there any evidence that Medicaid recipients in states with higher physician fees actually do better than those in states with lower fees? You know, the evidence is very mixed. When one sort tries to sort out the question of access to Medicaid and physician participation or physician availability to beneficiaries, the picture is relatively mixed. When it comes to primary care, children do as well on Medicaid as they do when privately insured, and adults do pretty well themselves. When it comes to specialty care, the picture for children remains relatively strong. The picture for adults is much grimmer. There are clearly access problems that emerge, and states have experimented with various approaches to promoting access to specialty services through techniques such as telemedicine or the use of what you could think of as specialty-enabled primary care, that is, primary care providers with a lot of additional specialist backup. And so the answer to your question is that in some cases, payment may not be the huge factor that one would think because there are compensating strategies like more community health centers or public clinics. And yet, when it comes to specialist care, the problem is serious. And quite frankly, for primary care, even though one could build community health centers, the fact is that community health centers only reach about a third of uninsured Americans. So the need for physician participation at the primary care stage is very great in Medicaid because there is just simply not enough alternative access to care. You note in your article that the Medicaid statute has an equal access provision that says that Medicaid provider payments must be sufficient to enlist enough providers so that care and services are available under the plan, at least to the extent that such care and services are available to the general population in the geographic area. Why has the Department of Health and Human Services never implemented that provision? That's a very good question. There is probably no more hot-button issue in the often 
tense relationship between the federal government and the state governments around Medicaid than payment and access. The statute, as you point out, emphasizes the issue of availability. That is to say, provider payment rates must be sufficient so that certain kinds of care are as available to Medicaid beneficiaries as they would be to anybody else. Now, we know that that is definitely not the case with physicians. Physicians participate in Medicaid at much lower rates, and as noted, there may be some compensating strategies such as community-based clinics, but that is hardly the same as having 88% physician participation, as the article points out, compared to only about two-thirds of physicians when it comes to Medicaid. The federal government has attempted to implement the statute, although I must say that the regulations trying to implement the statute first appeared about 20 years after the statute was enacted, and the regulations went nowhere. They were proposed, and then they disappeared. Every once in a while, one gets the whiff of a rumor that somebody is attempting to move an access rule again. But right now, we are operating with no agency interpretation, no authoritative agency interpretation of what it means for Medicaid beneficiaries to have access to care. And yet, this is as crucial an issue in Medicaid as there could be, and states are left without guidance as to what it means to promote policies that assure availability. And as a result, it has become a major flashpoint in the courts, as well as from an agency perspective. You mentioned the courts, and we know that the Supreme Court recently agreed to hear Exceptional Child Center versus Armstrong, a case that raises the question of whether beneficiaries and providers can actually protest low payments in court. Tell us about that case, and why do you think the court decided to consider this case, given that it declined a similar one just two years ago? This is a very interesting question, and quite frankly, I think many people were surprised when the court did what it did. In Exceptional Child, Inc., the situation presented is one that is actually quite different from the case that the court sort of punted on a couple of years ago. In the earlier case, which was known as Douglas, the court was presented with a situation in which the state of California had cut provider payment rates pretty substantially in a number of cases, a number of different kinds of payment arrangements. This was all around the terrible financial crisis that the state faced back a number of years ago. And beneficiaries and providers who were threatened with a significant financial injury and potential loss of access to services filed suit in order to try and stop the cuts from taking effect. The the ability to go to court in situations like this is a long-standing one under federal law when people are threatened with injury as a result of arguably unlawful state conduct under federal law. So filing the suit is not the same as winning the suit, but the principle is that one would have a day in court. In the Douglas case, CMS actually stepped in to review what California had done, and between the time that the case was litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court and the court's actual decision, CMS had made some final determinations of its own, had found that some of the rate cuts were perfectly legal, and some of the rate cuts were not, and a 5-4 majority essentially at that point said, you know what, this case basically has, as Justice Breyer called it, a different posture at this point. The complaint is now with the Secretary of HHS for having potentially approved some of the cuts. The complaint is no longer with the state of California. And essentially, they deflected the case. The chief justice was not happy about that. He felt that a bigger principle was at stake here, which is whether, in the first instance, the beneficiaries and providers should have had the ability to go to court at all. And he would have ruled, despite the change in posture, that these kinds of cases are not properly brought in federal court, that 
beneficiary and provider would have to wait for the federal government to simply review what the state did. And in the Douglas case, it was a two-year process. And I guess the assumption was that their access would just hinge on ultimate CMS outcomes and the courts would not be available to stop things before they got that bad. If you fast forward now to the Armstrong case, we have a situation in which CMS, several years ago, approved a payment rate that the state of Idaho was going to pay, in this case, a specialty child services program, and then the state never implemented the CMS-approved rate, and CMS did nothing about it. They simply never stepped in. There was no new filing by the state. The state just never made the payments. And after waiting years and years, the providers and beneficiaries brought a case to try and get the state to pay properly because payment, of course, is all bound up, particularly for specialty care and the quality of the care, the availability of the care ultimately. And the Court of Appeals, the same court that had decided the Douglas case, went along with providers, felt that they had the right to be in court, that this was not a case where CMS had taken action, as in Douglas, and ruled for the plaintiffs that the state was violating federal law. And even though the case was not in a posture where the federal agency had acted yet, the Supreme Court said, you know what, this is exactly what we faced three years ago now in Douglas, and they decided clearly that they wanted this time maybe to get at the merits, a situation where there is no possible CMS action that's going to get in the way of reaching the ultimate question of whether beneficiaries in this situation and providers can go to court. So here we are now, three years later, with the same issue presented to the court, but unlike Douglas, there is really probably little to no chance that CMS is going to do something that would get the court to deflect the case again, and we will finally reach this ultimate and very important question, whose importance really cannot be overstated, of whether when threatened with very serious injury because of a potential state violation of federal law, Medicaid beneficiaries and providers have recourse to the courts. They cannot go to CMS. They have no right under federal law to go to CMS and complain. So it's either the courts or nothing, and I guess we'll find out if it's going to be nothing. In another change, the Affordable Care Act funded pay increases for primary care services, and those increases are set to expire at the end of 2014. So do you see greater challenges for Medicaid recipients when it comes to obtaining care in 2015? The jury is still out on this because we don't have enough evidence yet to know how the pay increases might have affected the availability of physicians, although anecdotal evidence from a number of states suggests that they've actually observed some measurable positive shift in physician participation, both the number of physicians who participate and potentially the degree of participation that physicians might be willing to engage in. A lot of physicians might take Medicaid beneficiaries, but very, very, very few, and a pay increase might make it possible for physicians to see more Medicaid patients. The question, of course, is whether Congress would extend the federal funding for this extra pay, which is designed to raise payment rates for certain physician services up to Medicare levels. Thus far, of course, Congress does not appear to be willing to do that. The lame duck session, which is now underway here in Washington, probably is not going to deal with the physician pay bump. And nobody really knows whether Congress would be inclined to do it in 2015. So everybody is bracing for the loss of the federal incentive. I should note that any state, of course, could continue the higher pay at normal federal matching rate. It's only the bump that's at issue, not whether a state would get federal funding if it wanted to improve its fees. And a couple of states have said, we're going to maintain our improved fees no matter what, but I think most states are expected to fall back if the federal incentive is taken away. Finally, although you focus on reimbursement rates as the primary reason for low levels of physician participation, 
you acknowledge that there are other factors that might keep doctors from taking new Medicaid patients. What are some of those factors, and how can they be addressed? There are factors that have long been identified in the context of Medicaid beneficiaries, because Medicaid beneficiaries, of course, by virtue of the eligibility standards for the program, tend to face social and economic circumstances that are unique and make care more complicated. People, by definition, who are on Medicaid are either extremely poor at the outset or they have been deeply impoverished as a result of medical care costs. And with poverty comes great social risks that in turn have a significant impact on both health status and on patients' ability to comply with certain kinds of treatment regimens. For example, patients who are extremely impoverished and who have no reliable housing, no reliable access to kitchens, and insufficient funds to eat properly are going to have a hard time adhering to dietary recommendations, say, in relation to diabetes. Patients who are on Medicaid are more likely to have complex conditions. They're likely to be much more clinically complex to manage, a greater prevalence of mental illness, complicating physical health problems. And of course, many, many low-income people are more likely to face other kinds of barriers. For example, they may be members of culturally more isolated groups or their primary language may not be English. And it's one of the reasons why programs and interventions that are designed to adapt themselves to the social conditions of health have a strong track record with patients. So community health centers are known for the quality of their care because they are in and of their communities. There may be physicians who have been able to do that as well. There are stunning examples of physicians who have been able to adapt and adapt wonderfully to their communities, but physicians are not supported the way health centers are to adapt in this fashion. And so what you have is clinically, socially, and financially complex patients coupled with very low reimbursement rates, and this is sort of a recipe for problems. The way to ameliorate the problems is a combination of fee restructuring, but then affiliating physicians with interventions like a health center or a public health clinic that does, in fact, make it possible to practice with social support in the practice setting. Thank you, Professor Rosenbaum.